from our State House studio in Montgomery. I'm Todd Stacy. Welcome to Capitol Journal. The Alabama Legislature's 2023 regular session resumes tomorrow, and we'll get to that in a bit. But leading the news tonight is some troubling activity out of Mexico involving an Alabama company. Vulcan Materials today confirmed the apparent breach and seizure of its quarry and shipping facility by Mexican police and military forces. Over the weekend, surveillance video footage surfaced of Mexican police forcing their way through a security gate at Vulcan's Punta Venado port facility in Quintana Roo, Mexico, that's on the Yucatan Peninsula. Vulcan, a major producer of gravel and rock materials based in Birmingham, has been fighting in the courts to keep its facility open as the Mexican government has sought to annex the property for shipping and tourism purposes. The company confirmed the authenticity of the video, calling the action reckless and reprehensible. Here's their company's statement. Our first and foremost concern is the health and safety of our employees. We have confirmed that our Vulcan family members are physically unharmed and are focused on ensuring that this remains the case. We are highly concerned for our property and our business in Mexico. We have been unable to quarry and ship construction aggregate since the Mexican government illegally shut down our operations last year. Both of Alabama's U.S. Senators have been outspoken on the issue. U.S. Senator Tommy Tuberville responded with a floor speech from the Senate floor. He said the Biden administration should have acted sooner to pressure the Mexican government to stand down. I believe this shutdown, ordered by the President of Mexico, represents a baseless attack on a U.S. company and demonstrates a disregard for the rule of law. But even before shutdown orders were issued, Vulcan was subject to public harassment and intimidation tactics from the President of Mexico, including the Mex Mexican Navy sending troops to the entrance of Vulcan facility for the last several days before last week. Mexican Navy flying back Black Hawk helicopters and drones over Vulcan's property. The Mexican Navy sending patrol boats to Vulcan's harbor and the Mexican government withholding the issuance of a routine custom permit from January through mid-February. These actions by the president and Mexican government are contrary to the most basic principles of international law and the free trade agreements that bind our two countries together. These actions also go against the objectives and principles jointly set by the United States and Mexican government as part of the high-level economic dialogue established in September of 2021. However, President Obrador's attack on Vulcan is bigger than just one company. It undermines the rule of law in Mexico, ignores international law and free trade agreements, weakens our bilateral relationship, and will discourage future U.S. investments in Mexico. U.S. Senator Katie Britt released a statement Sunday night and spoke to reporters in Birmingham. She called the seizure unlawful and unacceptable and called on President Joe Biden to intervene. Back to the legislature, which will pick up where it left off two weeks ago before they went into special session. Tomorrow will be just day two of the session. Remember that the regular session can last up to 30 legislative days with, within 105 calendar days. That means the session will likely run into June. Among the items expected to come up this week are economic development incentives legislation and bills cracking down on violent crime. It will also be the first time we will see Governor Kay Ivey's proposed budgets, starting the process of passing the General Fund and the Education Trust Fund. Another issue we are likely to hear about this week is health care. A number of senators, including Senator Will Barfoot of Montgomery, want to prioritize support for health care in rural areas. I'd venture to say the vast, vast majority of us uh, in this body uh, have uh, a rural hospital or some form of rural health care that's important to the citizens that we represent. Uh, you know, you think about uh, uh, the, the baseball games, the, the football games that go on on Friday nights. 
Uh, you think about the automobile uh, accidents or, or maybe just uh, in terms of normal everyday occurrences, things that happen that we need emergency medical attention. And uh, a vast majority of the folks that, that we represent up here might not be able to make it to a, a larger urban area hospital. The position that we're in uh, as in the state and the rural health care side is largely a federal issue. Um, that those issues that uh, when we talk about reimbursement rates from uh, Medicare or Medicaid are uh, something at the national level that really need to be addressed. However, our hands are not going to be completely tied. And I'm challenging each of you here, each of you here and each of you in the House to begin working on uh, bills, to look at bills that are forthcoming and to see how they could help our rural health care providers, because I think that is important. The Senate's top leader, President Pro Tem Greg Reed, echoed Barfoot's sentiments. We have to stay focused on rural health care, and there are going to be coming in this session some topics that will allow us to make a difference on things associated with rural health care. And that doesn't take anything away from urban health care. But in looking at the strength of rural health care, there are things that we're going to be able to do. We've got, we're going to have several pieces of legislation related to nurses. We know that there's a nursing shortage. We need to stay focused on that, especially nurses in rural areas, as well as advanced practice nurses. We've made some changes and modifications for CRNA as a nurse practitioners, but in a lot of areas of my district, if we didn't have a nurse practitioner in those areas, we wouldn't have health care in some of those communities. Reed also said that a previously introduced measure to alter hospital and nursing home visitation rules, the one pushed by Senator Garland Gudger in the special, will move fast once the session resumes. A word of appreciation to Senator Gudger, as well as each of you who have spoken on this bill, uh, those that are in the gallery that are so interested in this legislation, those that have shared personal issues, personal stories that are related to this topic. Um, I want to thank each of them that have been involved and engaged. Um, we've moved through a difficult topic. We've been able to navigate this, Senator, in a way that you and I agree is very positive for the people of Alabama. I agree with you. The stakeholders that are engaged here, nursing homes, hospitals, trial lawyers, others that had a stake in this legislation have come to the front of the line and been willing to work with you, work with me, and being able to put this forward. Uh, it's going to be my commitment to you. And I've also had conversation with the Speaker of the House of Representatives. This legislation is my intent that it's on a hot rail moving quickly through this body of our passage. And we'll be right back with tonight's guest. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online at video.aptv.org. Capital Journal episodes are also available on APTV's free mobile app. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. And you can listen to past episodes of Capital Journal when you're driving or on the go with Capital Journal Podcasts. Keep up with what's happening with Capital Journal. The 375,000 acres that make up the three ranger districts of Talladega National Forest were purchased by the federal government in 1936 as part of an effort to restore clear-cut timberlands and farmlands no longer capable of producing crops. The beautiful reserve includes the 102-mile Pinhoti National Trail System and Alabama's highest and second highest points, Mount Cheeha and Duggar Mountain. Joining me next is State Representative Margie Wilcox from Mobile. Representative, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about a number of different topics, but first, congratulations are in order. You're the new chairman of the Boards, Commissions, and Appointments Committee. Is that correct? Boards, Commissions, and Agencies. And Agencies. Boards, Agencies, and Commissions. Uh, okay, I see. This is a, a committee that tends to be very busy 
throughout the session and out of session because of all the hundreds, if not thousands of appointments and boards, two boards and commissions the governor has to make, others have to make, uh, all ends up in your committee. Can you kind of walk me through your role there and, and how it's been since you won the chairmanship? Well, as you know, the, uh, the Boards Agency and Commission was chaired for a very long time from uh, Representative Sandiford. Mm -hmm. So it's new. I'm new to this role. I have served on this committee before. But this board, actually, this committee looks into all the Boards Agency Committee, especially the occupational uh, mm -hmm. committees and relates to all the occupations in the state of Alabama that require licensing. That feeds into the Sunset Committee which can either vote to sunset or make recommendations and oversee each committee. And we work very closely with um, Rachel Riddle and her department on that. All right, uh, examiners of public accounts. Right, so if you're, I mean, anything from, if you're a, a hairdresser, mm -hmm. you know, to a, a plumber, all a physician. the- Right, all these require licenses of, of which these boards and commissions, they have regulatory authority over, right? They do. And then you all have, oversight over them exactly yeah so um there's a lot going on with that in that they want to have you know some of the committee members want to have some more oversight over them and they want to look at the models in florida in georgia on how they handle it where it's by the secretary of state or by a department within the government that does some of the back office stuff so when i first heard that i was going to be chair of this committee i reached out to the council of state governments which uh, alabama is a member and um, got some of their staff to give me some background on what georgia and florida does mm -hmm. um, by and large i think the most people that i've talked to the members that have an interest in this like the georgia example so i had gotten approval from the speaker we're going to do a little field trip over there to georgia and get them to explain how it is that they do it differently than what the state of Alabama does and at least be open-minded and look at those models. I was curious about that because listening to the governor's state of the state speech she talked about cutting red tape wanting to examine a lot of state government and see where maybe there's duplication or um, redundancy or, or something like that in ways the state can be more efficient. I'm guessing boards and commissions might be a part of that conversation. Matter of fact, your colleague Chris Elliott was on the show the other day saying just that. It is. And we do know that, that she is looking to this committee and these boards in particular on making sure that we don't have too many. We want to have a safe environment for our citizens when people do services for them. But we want to make sure that we don't create so many obstacles to people getting to work. And sometimes some of these uh, fees and fines and such are looked at as an obstacle and not so much helping people enter the marketplace. Well, yeah, because there's a lot of talk about workforce development, um, preventing or removing barriers for folks from getting into the workforce. Mm -hmm. uh, AIDT had this great poll the other day that they conducted with Signal about, you know, why is it that you remain on the sidelines? Why aren't you going to work? And, you know, these barriers were, were part of it, some kind of licensing, some kind of credential and things like that. A lot of talk on the national level about occupational um, licensing reform. You mm -hmm. know, does it, does, should it require so much credentialing? Are, are we are we overdoing it on that? Has there been any early feedback or are y'all still kind of looking into the issue? We're still looking, it's very premature um, to say that we've decided on anything. Sure. But with a very open mind, we're looking at what the governor desires and her administration and talking with them. There's the Efficiency Committee, which many members of the Sunset are also on that Efficiency Committee of the Governors, so we'll be looking to them for guidance on, on those particulars. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm curious, you, you mentioned Senator, I mean, you mentioned Representative Sandiford, and you're right, he was he was doing that committee for a long time. He was. So did he, did he have any advice for you when he took over? Well, he's got a lot of advice. He left me all of his notes. I have a stack of all the bills and his uh, particular notes. Decades worth, I'm sure. <laughs> well, at well, least since 2010. Since, since, yeah, since mm -hmm. the Republicans took over, right. Okay. So he was a CPA, and um, I'm not a CPA. So the first thing I did when the speaker was deciding, I said, please make sure that we have a CPA and an attorney on each of the committees, and that will help them go, f you know, help us do our work. Mm -hmm. Now, I know you're also on the license tag committee, and mm -hmm. y'all met today. What 
what happened today? What was going on? Well, what we had was I just had a meeting to go over the next agenda with the um, revenue department. Okay. And then we were looking, uh, we had some of the clerks come in to get an idea of uh, what would be need to service that committee. So we have everything from people wanting to have a historic tag coming up on this agenda, but doesn't meet the guidelines now. So we've got to try to tell people, yes, I understand you want to have a historic tag, but we have legibility and readability issues now that we have to take into account. So um, the license plate committee interacts with some of the people across the state that are doing the best work in the world. They're nonprofits. They're doing the work that the state can't get into and helping people. So I do love that committee, um, but it is a, it's a different committee that you're interacting and trying to make sure that we pattern. We have a lot of distinctive tags in Alabama. We're, we're one of the states that sells the most distinctive tags. So trying to make sure that they're legible and uh, that the money is being spent correctly. Right, because the organization gets a, gets, it was able to fundraise off that extra exactly. fee. Exactly, some right? of them very significantly. I think University of Alabama sells the most tags. That stands to reason. <laughs> yeah, yeah, they have a lot of fans. <laughs> Um, I wanted to talk about, you know, we're, we're starting the regular session back tomorrow. It's actually just going to be the second day of session, even though y'all have been here for two weeks. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of issues that have been waiting for two weeks to come up. I've heard a lot about economic incentives. We've got, you know, the, the current law, Alabama Jobs Act, Growing Alabama Act, they're going to sunset this year. They're going to expire, which is on purpose to give you all an opportunity or almost force you to, to make changes. Um, to that, to those incentive laws. These are what we use to recruit companies to Alabama. I mean, I think everybody, most everybody, seems to agree that they are necessary to reauthorize. But I'm hearing lots of talk about possible changes to the legislation or, or things that people are particularly wanting. Have you heard any of that talk, or is anything you in particular are going to be looking for in these incentive bills? Well, yeah. I mean, I have heard a lot of talk, and you're right. That's a hot button. Um, over the years, the economic incentive bills have morphed and we've kind of changed. You know, the last time, uh, several years ago, we did the clawback that if you didn't do what you had promised you'd do when we gave you those abatements, some of those uh, tax credits would be clawed back. And now they're credits and not stuff up front so much. Um, one of the things that has come to light in Mobile County is that some companies have been reluctant to pay the only tax that we don't abate, which is the school tax. So um, I want to put some language in this economic incentives bill that says, look, we want you to come to the state. We want to give you these abatements that we have negotiated on the front end. We want good corporate citizens. But when it comes time to pay the school tax, we'd like for you to pay the bill as presented. Hmm. Right now, our tax officials can only use one book and that was for, I've checked with revenue, there's a good reason why. It has national implications, it's accepted in all the other states as well. So there's a reason why our officials, when assessing that, can only use this one book. But if it's challenged, sometimes companies use any other manner of comparison. And you're not really doing apples to apples, so it kind of convolutes things. There's a case in Mobile County right now with a company contesting their school tax. And I really think that I want the state to invite companies that were readily willing and able to pay their school tax because they're the ones that wants an educated and ready workforce. Mm. You have to fund your school system to be able to get that. So maybe even putting it in the law um, specific to the, the contract that is signed, maybe something making it clear that this, this means you've got to pay, absolutely pay you know the, the the taxes at the local level that, that you're required right. to as as presented right right no I mean that that makes a lot of sense and I think I've heard a lot um, of lawmakers have similar things maybe not that specifically but others saying look I'm all for it but I'm gonna be looking for this and this and one of those things is transparency which is kind of interesting because I because I've heard it, it sounds like the plan that's coming forward that the lieutenant governor's commission worked on everything is gonna have a lot to do with transparency allowing the public via the website to see exactly what the incentives are, exactly what the tax credits are. And I, I talked to one lawmaker who said, you know, I'm not so sure. It's like, I love, I love transparency, but I'm not so sure we should be showing our playbook, you know, to the, to the other states who we're competing against. Has there been any talk in caucus about that? 
Not yet, but I think we've got it on the agenda for this week, so I think there's going to be plenty of conversations about that. And one of the other incentives that we want to make sure of is Georgia has done an excellent job of um, requiring companies to utilize their ports. Mm -hmm. So as a part of this incentive package, we want to encourage and um, put some stuff in there to incentivize them to use the ports. Or, you know, I'd love to say, look, if you're going to ship cars, you're going to ship them out of, you know, our port. One of the speakers had a lot to say about that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, and he's at the opposite end of the state than where you are. You're obviously very involved with the port and everything. I thought that was interesting, saying, look, you know, we need to be absolutely sh- shipping cars, all the cars we produce out of here, or at least the ones that require sea transport, out of Mobile. Right, and now there's some new infrastructure in Mobile where it's basically a train rail that goes up on, t- you know, you can, so right. it goes right up on there ships and they roll right on off so the Alabama port has invested in infrastructure to be able to handle and have roll on roll off and we want the cars that are the vehicles that are manufactured in Alabama to go through the Alabama port Georgia has done an excellent job of diverting some of the things manufactured in Mobile out of their port and we just want to do the corrective measures to get that benefit out of Alabama speaking Mobile you are also the chair of the Mobile uh, delegation the new chair it. yes and so uh, it comes with some that's interesting that that that, um, that area has changed so much over the years in terms of the I mean th- th- think about Victor Gaston who was here for so long um, and so lots of turnover I, I suppose what did y- are, y'all find it easy to work together with your with yourselves and also your neighbors down there in Baldwin we do, and we do play, you know, the coastal delegations work and go to a lot of meetings together. It is a change. I've not ever been the delegation chair. There are a lot of responsibilities that come with that that I'm learning as we go. So the first thing was to get our office staffed up. We've got some more staff and trying to come up with some ideas to streamline it because we want our entire delegation, the Democrats and Republicans, to have the resources that they need in our delegation office to help them be the best representatives that they can. Mm-hmm. And while I've got you, you're also on the majority whip team. Yeah. This is this is something I remember from Congress because, you know, and up there, goodness, it was 435. But you got a lot of members, 105 members. One person can't be counting all those votes. It takes a team. So have you enjoyed your work in I you loved know, it when the I boats. yeah when I was uh, I started doing this four years ago with uh, Representative Garrett Chairman Garrett, and there was some bills that he you know that he did not want to take the lead on, so they allowed me to kind of take his place. I love going and you know talking to the members, and you, you actually find out more about a bill the more you find out what somebody's opinion of. So you've got to really enjoy you know talking with the members and listening to their ideas and getting their vote count. Um, four years ago at one point I'll say we're at the two year mark and I was like well I'll trade you so and so you know because he just won't give me an answer (laughs) and that's right because you're asking where are you yeah and then you had one other member said oh oh well I'll trade you so and so because I get a history lesson on exactly why this is a bad bill and so it really kind of came out amusing that we all had somebody that we needed to to build the trust, you know, or do something different with and swap around. So I'm very proud to be working uh, under Chairman Shedd on this. I enjoy working with Randall. Um, and But you've got to like it if you're going to do it because it does involve a lot of work. And, and again, a lot of members may not want to tell you where they're, where they're sitting, where they're Right, and what you have to tell them is that, look, I'm just trying to, you know, your first run at it, you just tell them, look, I'm just trying to get a vote for leadership. You know, I, I've got to get this to the speaker's office, or I got to get this leadership. And then I basically turn around like, I don't care how you vote. I'll come back and tell you when I care about how you vote. So that's always the classic line. Now, right now, I'm just trying to get a vote count. Yeah. I'll come back and tell you if the speaker or our representative Todd Hagen has an opinion and wants me to come back and try to influence you. Yeah. Well, that's interesting. I love offering our viewers some inside baseball to how it kind of works on the floor. And that is the fun part. You know, I think during COVID, everybody would say that uh, since I wear tennis shoes, you know, I kind of move kind of faster. And they're like, you look like a little water bug down there. And I was like, well, that's when I'm getting a vote count. And then at one point, um, four years ago, I was just trying to get a vote count of myself on where something stood. And I got called down going, what are you doing a vote count for? And I was like, oh, like, you just don't go do individual vote counts for you. <laughs> you know, So it is a fun part of it. It really is. Well, we're out of time. You've been very gracious with your time here on a Monday to come down and, and speak with us. Uh, good luck as this 
regular session resumes. Sounds like it's going to be a busy time, but we'll be here for all of it. All right. Thank you so much. We'll be right back. You can watch past episodes of Capital Journal online anytime at Alabama Public Television's website, aptv.org. Click on the online video tab on the main page. You can also connect with Capital Journal and link to past episodes on Capital Journal's Facebook page. The quilters of G Spend are world renowned for their traditional quilt designs. The inhabitants of the small Alabama River town are mostly descendants of enslaved African Americans. G's Bend has demonstrated a persistent cultural wealth in the vibrant style of its quilts. Quilt making has a long history in Alabama, and there are no finer examples of this art form than the motifs and craftsmanship of the quilts of G's Bend. That's our show for tonight. Thanks for watching. We'll be back tomorrow night at 1030 with more coverage of the legislative session right here on Alabama Public Television. For our Capital Journal team, I'm Todd Stacey. We'll see you next time.